So, this was a few months ago, and quarantine was already in place, so I spent a lot more time at home and around home than usual. There is a park very close to my house, so one day, I decided to go for a little jog. I ran from my house into the park, and since I don't have a lot of cardio, I decided to take a little break. I noticed that a guy was looking my way, but I didn't think anything of it, until I started jogging again, and he started walking at the same time. Since I was jogging, I eventually lost him so I thought it was over, but oh was I wrong. It's now many hours later, and I'm sleeping, when through the window I notice car lights coming back and forth on my street. The window in my room gives me a view of the street. Now, some may think it's normal, but I live in a very quiet neighborhood, so I wanted to see what was going on. As I thought, there was a car that was traveling back and forth on my street. Then, the car stops right in front of my house, and the same guy comes out of the passenger seat, which means there's at least one other person with him. Until that point, I was still half awake, but the sight of that same guy looking up to my window, seeing me and smiling, woke me the F up real quick. I immediately closed the blinds, which are a tiny bit see-through by the way, and climb in my bed, phone in hand. After a few minutes, I fell asleep, only to be woken up by light tapping on my window. Remember when I said that my blinds are see-through? Well, I could make out the silhouette of a man, probably the same guy since there were still car lights in the street, and he was crouched at my window tapping from outside. The first thing that comes to my mind is to not move and try to pretend that I'm still asleep, not knowing if he could see inside my room or not, and then I remember that my room is on the second floor. How the hell did he climb onto the little roof area outside my window? Absolutely no idea, but I know that going down is not easy. I slowly pulled the covers over my head and called the police, whispering and telling them that the guy was still tapping. They told me to slowly get out of reach of the window, in case he breaks in or something, and that they would be there in about five minutes. I crawled out of bed and into the bathroom, where I could see the street behind my house, and waited. After a couple of minutes, I heard the knocking stop, then silence, and then a big thump, then more silence and a knocking at my door downstairs. I was still on the phone with the operator when I heard someone call out that it was the police and that the guy was gone. I told the operator that police had arrived and they told me, wait, there was silence and she said that police was not yet arrived and to not open the door under any circumstances. Soon enough, she tells me the police is now there and that I can go open the door. I go check outside of my bedroom window out of paranoia and there were in fact three police cars and about five or six police officers outside my house. I go downstairs, as one of them is knocking, and I open the door, thank the operator, and hang up. I tell them the whole thing, and they tell me that the guy was already gone when they arrived, but that there was no one there anymore. In the next days, I saw officers on my street, but I never got news from the guys. The only thing they found was a rope and a small knife. No fingerprints, no guy, no car, nothing. I was about 20 or 21 at the time this incident took place. I was a female university student, but I commuted to my campus, so I lived at home. A good friend of mine went to the same school, so we stayed close into our adulthood. She had recently started working out at a branch of a popular chain of gyms that was nearby, and she asked me to be her gym buddy. I was more than happy to, and I started joining her. Whenever we went, we had our little routine weights, cardio, and then to the pool. This gym had a great pool for laps, but of course you had to shower before you got in, especially after working up a sweat doing other exercises. The locker room connected the main section of the complex to the pool area, and it had little cubicles to shower off in. We used these showers all the time without a second thought. The building had been around for a long time. Before it was this particular gym, it was another gym from a different company and so on. The place wasn't exactly modern or renovated, and in some areas, the showers in particular, it was pretty dilapidated. Some of the tiles were cracked or had fallen off completely. One day, the stall I was in was missing tiles all around the handles, but I didn't pay attention to it. I figured it was only pipe work back there, but that day, I got an odd feeling. So, I bent down to look through the hole in the shower wall. Lo and behold, there was a pair of eyes staring straight at me. I could tell it was a man, maybe middle-aged. 
Even staring directly at him, having caught him peeping, he stared right on. He never looked away. His gaze, animalistic and intent, the hole went straight through to another room, presumably the showers in the men's locker room. I turned the shower head so that I could hide in the corner and finish up out of his line of sight, and I promptly reported it to the staff. They went looking for him in the men's locker room, but never found the culprit. I jogged my memory, trying to recall if any particular person had been watching me in the gym that day, but it could have been any one of dozen or so men I casually walked out next to, in the same room, none the wiser. Within only a couple of days, the staff had patched up all the shower walls. I'm glad it won't happen to any other unsuspecting girls there, but shower peeper, let's not meet. <laughs> So, I'm in my early 20s and female. I moved out on my own for the first time about two years ago. I haven't had much to do with any of my neighbors. I've always been slightly uneasy to the fact that no one around here is looking out for me. If anything seems off, no one would notice or do any investigating to make sure I'm alright. Last year, I noticed a man constantly walking his dog in the grass area behind my home. This isn't unusual to see. It's a common area for residents here. His dog is super cute and my cat liked to play with it through the glass door out back. They would just chase each other back and forth and put their paws up to the glass and such. Real cute stuff. Well, one day I was outside, and his dog came running up to my porch with glee to get pets and say hi to his kitty friend. This is the first time I actually spoke to this neighbor. We'll call him Mark. So, Mark seemed decent enough, and we got along just fine. We started hanging out pretty often in a short time period, because I'm a smoker and he was letting his dog out all the time. And it was summer, so we ran into each other quite often, and would spend an hour or more after work most days talking. This lasted for a couple of weeks. I gave him my phone number and was happy to have a friend in my complex. I will say, he was clearly very interested in either having a romantic relationship with me, or at least being butt buddies. He said this quite a lot. Not butt buddies, but you get what I'm saying. I was very honest with him that I wasn't interested in either at all, and had to tell him this quite often. Frankly, I was getting rather irritated that this came up several times every time we spoke. He rather quickly was trying to get me in his house. From the first time we talked until the last, he offered multiple times every time I saw him. I always said no and blamed it on me being COVID cautious. He quickly got tired of that excuse and invited himself to my home as well. I always said no. One day he came out while I was smoking with a bottle of wine and a couple of glasses, saying I had to try this stuff because it's delicious. I instantly noticed that the seal is broken, screw cap bottle, but doesn't seem like anything was drank. The bottle was filled to the brim, which I also thought was a little odd because usually wine isn't filled to the tippy top like that, so he pours a couple of glasses and doesn't drop a beat in telling me to take a drink. I felt very uncomfortable, but didn't want him to feel like he was being accused of anything when he's just trying to be a nice friendly neighbor. After all, he poured himself a glass of this very same stuff, right? Well, my mama still raised me better than that so I totally faked a sip and said it was good. After any sentence either of us said, he would again tell me to take a drink. I told him I don't really drink, so I'm pacing myself, but did say that I noticed he hadn't drank any, and to please go ahead. He didn't reach for his glass right away, but in the middle of speaking, he reached for his cup and knocked it over, spilling the wine into the grass. He brushed it off rather quickly, and told me it's my turn to drink now. I said, but you still haven't drank anything. You spilled your drink, pour yourself another glass, I don't want to drink alone. So, he did. He still didn't drink anything. He did tell me a few moments later to drink mine. I told him that he needs to catch up, and we basically just kept doing that in circles. He reached for his glass again and guess what? Spilled it again. Wine's all in the grass now. Then he told me to drink. At this point, I'm done. Too many red flags are screaming at me to get the hell out. I'm honest with him, but this seemed really sketchy, and I didn't trust the drink because he's refusing to drink any, but is way too eager for me to drink mine. He told me he was just clumsy and taking it slow because he doesn't drink a lot, but he's seen me have friends over taking shots and drinking beers and wine, so he knows I'll handle it better than him. Yet another red flag is raised. So, he's been watching me, huh? I think it's important to mention that our complex is huge. He used to work here and knows the maintenance crew, and he doesn't live particularly near me. He's about half a block away from me and cannot see my windows or yard from where he lives, and has a few different common area yards closer to him that he could use for his dog. So I told him that I'm flat out not drinking anything, because of how all this seemed. He once again pours himself a glass, and once again spills it. There isn't much left in the bottle at this point. I pour the remaining wine in his glass and tell him to drink with me on three. We raise our glasses, 
To my amazement, he actually takes a drink, and I spilled mine into the grass. Oops. He comes out about two nights later while I was smoking, and instantly starts complaining to me that I wouldn't date him or have sex with him, and he doesn't know why all girls are like this. He starts getting really loud, shouting at me asking what the problem with him is, that I won't do these things. I told him that I'd been honest with him since I had met him that I'm not interested in that, and that it isn't him specifically. I'm just honestly not interested in that from anyone right now. He still shouted at me and started complaining about his ex and her dog. Yes, her dog. Then proceeded to tell me that he used to abuse the shit out of that dog, and went into detail about how he wouldn't feed or water it because it used the bathroom in the house, and how he would kick it really hard. I'm horrified at this point, especially considering this whole time he's telling me this he's playing fetch with his little dog. His dog always seemed scared of him, and I had even pointed that out in the past, and he said that his dog's previous owners were abusive, so he's just very scared and distrusting. The dog was always very excited to see me though, and would cuddle up with me and stay by me, so I always thought I was extra special. But with that knowledge, I just think the poor guy is currently in an abusive household. I was so done with this guy, that I just cut him off and said I needed to go, because my friends were waiting on me. He sent me several messages of gibberish when he's outside. He'll just blow my phone up with, Hey, hi, Jajeb, Jajeb, Jek, LOL, my name, hi, Kwabjik. It'll just keep going. He's texted me telling me that he knows I'm home because he's seen me walking around, that he sees my car a lot. He'll throw his dog toys on my porch, I think trying to get my attention to come out because of the cute dog. He'll just stand outside my porch for hours. It's all cold and rainy and snowy these days so it's even creepier. I think in his mind since I'm a smoker, I'll come out eventually. Silly him though, because I just go out front when I see him out there. He said several things to me before the wine fiasco went down that were red flags. I figured it might be a language or cultural differences though, because English is the third language he's learned, and America is the third country he's lived in. I guess moral of the story is to just trust your gut. He's still bothering me, and like I'd said, we only spoke and hung out for a few weeks in summer of 2020. My last message from him was last night. He asked me what he had done wrong, and if I felt disrespected in any way. I've not spoken to him since he screamed at me for not sleeping with him, sandwiched with admitting horrible animal abuse. I thought about answering his text with the brutal truth about how twisted and creepy he presented himself as, and how uncomfortable he made me feel, but I didn't want to give him any ideas on how he should improve. Stay smart, folks. Don't drink things people give you if the seal is broken. He was definitely trying to drug me. To everyone telling me to move, I really appreciate the concern for my safety. I'd love to move since I've become uneasy in my own home environment, but moving is expensive, and not something I can afford at the moment. I also do have a stun gun, pepper spray, and handgun. I'm extremely reluctant to ever use a gun on a person, but I do have training on the weapon. I do bring the pepper spray with me every time I go outside now, even if it's just to take garbage out or pop in my car for a second. Currently experiencing something similar at my current gym, which reminded me of Brett. I am a male. When I was around 19, I got really into weightlifting at my university's rec center. It was a massive complex with multiple weight rooms, two indoor tracks, an Olympic swimming pool, the works. I'd lift four to five times a week and often cool off with laps in the pool. One day in the weight room, I was approached by a guy named Brett. He didn't look like a student. He was older, probably late 30s, early 40s, but very friendly. The rec center wasn't just for students. Anyone could purchase a membership. Casual conversation is pretty common in gyms. And I was so naive in those days, I didn't think anything of it when he asked personal questions, like where I was from and where I worked, which was at a grocery store in my hometown, the next town over. I didn't see this guy in the gym every day, but it was common to run into him a couple times a week. We'd shoot the shit for a bit, and I began to sense that he was interested in more than just saying hi. One day, he mentioned that he'd been by the grocery store where I worked but didn't see me there and wanted to know what my schedule was. Despite my naivete, I immediately recognized that this wasn't normal and that I didn't want to talk to this guy anymore. I lied and told him my schedule was different every week and got back to my workout. One day, not long after, I was walking into work to start my shift. We started at 9 a.m. and he was there in the foyer just hanging around. He called out and tried to talk to me, but I told him, hey man, I'm at work right now. After that, I didn't really talk to him in the gym anymore. Looking for me at my job was too weird, and it pissed me off. He'd approach me and I'd just coldly say hey and look away. The final straw was one evening when I'd just finished swimming laps. 
The shower room was an open room with four shower stands, each with four nozzles pointing north, east, south, and west, so four people could use the same stand at once. No curtains, no partitions, which may seem odd these days, but I never thought anything of it since I grew up swimming at this pool. I was in there alone showering, my swim trunks hanging on the drying rack, when I glanced toward the doorway to the locker area and saw this motherfucker peeking around the doorway watching me shower. He immediately ducked back and was gone by the time I finished up and went to get dressed. I went straight to the service counter to report what had happened. I only knew his first name, but they seemed to know who I was talking about. Never saw him again after that. All right, so this happened at my parents' house when I was 16 or 17 years old. 25 now, but thinking about it still gives me the goosebumps. It was nearing the end of my summer break, and my parents decided they were going to go on one more fishing trip before the students all get back in school. My mom ran a cafe in front of a high school. They gave me the usual rundown of how to reach them and blah blah blah, and were on their way. My parents took my dad's jeep, and my mom's car was in the shop because, well, she's a small Asian woman who refuses to wear glasses. So going out was completely out of the question for me. So I did what any teenage girl would do with a house of empty adults and a fully stocked bar. My dad is quite the drinker. I stayed home all weekend and binge ate snack foods and watched every Netflix B-horror movie I had rented. Thank you, Dad, for the three movies at a time rentals. It was Saturday night, well into the AM, and I was downstairs on my dad's leather recliner. Had a bowl of popcorn, eyes glued to the TV as I watched Ringu. I had all the lights off to really get myself in that horror movie feel when I really, really had to pee. I didn't want to turn on the lights because I'm lazy, so I walked over to the half bath by the front door and did my business. I didn't bother turning the bathroom light on because F it, staying lazy. As I sat there, pondering the plot of Ringu, I looked up at the window that faced the front of the yard. It's an oval window and instead of buying curtains for it, my dad just used some of that frosty privacy film. It basically keeps anyone from looking in, but you can vaguely see things if you look out. Well, as I zoned out, I noticed something quite odd. There's a shape on the window that looks a lot like a person. Now, the reason I say this was odd was because the front porch lights were off. There was a shadow because of the street light in front of our house. As my gears were turning, the shadow moved out of sight. It was at the exact moment I realized that whoever was out there got past the lights without them going off. Like most porch lights, ours were motion sensitive. In actuality, ours were super sensitive. A good sized leaf could set that sucker off. The only way to not make those lights go off is if you go around the side of the house and crawl over the banister. As I realized this, I also realized that this person was standing in front of the front door. <laughs> I no longer had to pee. I awkwardly slid off the toilet, pulled my pants up and did a military style crawl into the living room and freaked the fuck out. Whoever this individual was had to have practiced not making that light go off. Also, there were no cars in the driveway, so they know no one is home. There's always my dad's Jeep or my mom's car in the driveway. This was the first time there wasn't. I'm lying on the floor and my ears perk up at the sound of someone pacing the front porch. And now, I'm scared they're actually going to break in and see this small girl all alone in the house. I'm not particularly stupid, so I make my way, crawling, mind you. I'm terrified so my legs were not cooperating, to the kitchen, and grab the telephone. As I grab it, the footsteps stop, as if someone left the porch. I turn to look at the front door and realize the lights haven't turned on. We have those small, useless windows above the door by the ceiling. So that means the person jumped off the side. I look towards the back door and before my eyes make it, they fall onto a window. A window that has the blinds raised. I don't think I've ever ran so fucking fast before. See, we keep the blinds up by the kitchen table because our two cats are little shits and will destroy the blinds if they can't see outside. I ran over to the window and closed the blinds and sat on the floor. I have no idea if the person saw me, but if they knew that much about the porch lights, they know that those blinds are always raised. There was still a glow from the TV, so I didn't see anyone when I ran over, but now I'm twice as horrified. I kind of sat there for a bit, straining to hear any movement outside, 
but I wasn't hearing them until I heard the porch door get shaken. My dad put a hook on the porch door so that we could let the cats out without them running away. But most of the time, my mom forgets to hook it closed because she's short and way forgetful. The reason I heard the door shake was because my dad must have locked it last time he was out there. Full panic now. Three things. One person knows how to work porch lights. Two, they know about uncovered window that I hopefully covered in time. Three, knew about the porch door being unlocked 99.9% .9 of the time. Now, while I should have called the police at this time like a smart person, I called my dad. As the phone is ringing, I'm making sure the back door is locked, the door to the garage is locked, and the front door is locked. It took a while, but my dad answers the phone half pissed and half worried. I tell him not to freak out, but that I am freaking out. I pretty much tell him what's happening, and he's like, Call the police, what the fuck? At this point, I'm in my parents' room and flick on the lights. I tell him I will, but that I wanted to call him, you know, just in case. He said he'd call the neighbors, and for me to call the police. The reason I turned on my parents' bedroom light was to, hopefully, give the image that an adult was present at the home. Before I called the police, I casually turned on every light in the house. By casually, I mean I ran around the house like a madwoman. When the police came, no one was found. In fact, I was so afraid to actually open the door to the cop, I demanded he show me some identification. He showed me his badge and called the police station to confirm his identity. My neighbors let my parents know I was safe and that they didn't find whoever was walking the house. My parents drove home right after the phone call and my neighbors stayed with me until they actually arrived. For the following week, I was horrified to be home alone. Not to mention we have woods as our backyard. So I was scared that whatever it was, was skulking in the woods, waiting. I refused to open the blinds for the cats and to use the downstairs half bath. What's even scarier is on the end of that following week, a woman's house was broken into and she was raped. Her husband had left for a business trip and the perp broke into the house via the back door. Just knowing that if I was asleep, or if they realized a teenage girl was home, I would have had a completely different experience. I'd like to preface this by saying that not all mental health professionals are terrible people. Good doctors and medication have saved my life. I also didn't grow up in the US, so if you see something in this story that makes you go, that's not how that works, keep in mind that other countries might have different laws. Furthermore, this describes my experiences with staying in a mental hospital, so prepare for triggers. All right, here we go. I was a troubled kid. I'm kind of a troubled person in general. But when I was in my early teens, specifically in this story, I was 14. I was cutting, suicidal, and refusing to go to school. So, I was put on a waiting list for a children's mental hospital. I know now that the fact that I was on that waiting list for close to half a year should have been the first warning sign. At the time, I enjoyed being on sick leave from school, which basically meant I got to play The Sims until 6 in the morning for 5 months straight. But, when I had to pack my stuff to actually go to the hospital, I of course didn't really want to go. I wanted to get help, don't get me wrong, but the idea of being away from home for 6 weeks, which is the standard time they take to analyze and watch you to give you a diagnosis, after which you can choose to pursue treatment, scared me. I arrived at the hospital in tears, my mom carrying my suitcase for me. The nurses noticed that obviously didn't want to stay. Are you here of your own free will? The doctor asked me. I shook my head. They just shrugged it off, saying they could get a judicial decision forcing me to stay here. I never go to talk to a judge. I never got to defend or explain myself. And as far as I know, my parents didn't talk to a judge either. A judge glossed over my medical history and then signed a piece of paper that forced me to stay in this hellhole for six weeks. The contents of my suitcase were searched, and I remember feeling like I had just arrived in prison. The first terrifying thing happened on my first night. As a cutter, my arms were in horrific shape. When wounds heal, they itch. I scratched open some of my old scabs, and when I went to the nurse to ask for a bandage, everyone went nuts. In their eyes, I had purposely harmed myself, which they couldn't prove, but okay. So what do you do when a 14-year-old mental patient harms herself? Talk to her? Try to help? Nah, you take away all her jewelry a necklace from my mom, and a bracelet from my ex-girlfriend, 
who at the time I still had very strong feelings for, and send her off to the timeout room for 24 hours. The timeout room was a small room with a big window that could just barely fit a bed. If I had to use the bathroom, I had to ask a nurse to accompany me. And no joke, at one point I was in the bathroom, with a nurse standing guard in front of the door. She asked if I was doing okay, and I sarcastically responded with, No, I'm cutting myself with the toilet paper. She goes, Really? and rips open the door. Fucking Christ. All of my clothes, including underwear and PJs, were taken from my room and kept in the front office for the time I stayed in the timeout room. So whenever I needed clothes, I had to go up to the front office to ask for them, but apart from having to ask for clothes and bathroom trips, I was completely left alone in that room. No one ever came to check on me. Getting out of the timeout room wasn't a lot better. For the first week or two, I had horrible stomach problems. I would get up multiple times a night to use the bathroom, which by the way, you didn't have one of in your room. You had to walk down the hall to the bathrooms. Because my stomach kept me up all night, I would often not get enough sleep and end up sleeping through the day, which led to me not taking part in group activities. And instead of, I don't know, waking me up, I was bitched at that, and I quote, if I was up all night roaming the halls, I'd be tired too. What, do you want me to just shit the bed or? And because I didn't partake in group activities, I couldn't earn outside time. Yes, I had to earn going outside. Even just sitting on the front steps with a nurse right next to me had to be earned. So for the first six weeks, I was effectively locked up, except for school and weekends, where I was allowed to go home. It was blatantly obvious that none of the nurses really cared about any of the patients. They weren't even real nurses. They were more like prison guards. One of them straight up looked like a homeless guy. Another sounded like she'd been a five packs a day smoker her life, and all and I mean all of them, were chain smokers. Every free second they had, they'd use for smoke breaks. Right outside the door, too, with the doors open, so that all the other kids who were currently going through nicotine withdrawals could smell the cigarette smoke. I saw a real nurse once a week. She mainly checked me for self-harm. One time, I self-harmed at home over the weekend. I told her my pet bunny did it, and she believed me. Within six weeks of staying at the mental hospital, I saw a psychiatrist a whopping two times, once for a general introduction and once for an IQ test. Oh, and did I mention that you were allowed to have a razor in the shower? Or the huge bird spider that sat in the corner of one of the showers for the entire time I stayed there? Or the cobwebs and silverfish that were everywhere? Anyone who's ever struggled with mental illness probably knows that sentences like just pull yourself together or get over it are the least helpful things one could say to a mentally ill person. I've never heard it that much in my entire life. There was one instance where another patient, who was deadly afraid of spiders, came running out of her room in a borderline panic attack because she had woken up to a spider directly in front of her face. Know what they told her? Don't be such a baby. It's just a spider. They gave her a broom for her to get rid of the spider herself which obviously she couldn't do. My roommate and I ended up helping her. Both of us were scared of spiders as well, mind you. But possibly the most outrageous thing happened on my second to last day. Someone had told the guards that I had smuggled in a razor blade, so they pulled me out of breakfast and searched my body from top to bottom, stripping me naked, with the door to the nurse's room wide open. When they didn't find a razor blade on me, they tore apart my room. They didn't find one there either, but found one laying on the floor in the hallway. It was even still in its wrapper. I wasn't the only patient who cut herself. As a matter of fact, I don't think there was a single female patient who didn't cut herself. That blade could have belonged to anyone. They had no proof it was mine. But of course, it was deemed that it was mine. And despite me not having any new cuts on my arm, I was thrown into the timeout room for another 24 hours. Literally my last 24 hours. And they paid so little attention to the timeout room that a fellow inmate was able to slip a letter with a razor blade inside under the door so I could take out my frustrations on myself. In case you were wondering where my parents were in all of this, my mother wanted to get me out of that place as soon as she heard about the timeout room, but since my parents had joint custody, she needed my father to agree to it. My father deserves a let's not meet story for himself, but to make it short, he hadn't talked to me in over four years, but was somehow convinced that I needed help and refused to get me out of there. My final diagnosis from that place? Narcissistic neurosis. I was 14, 
and to this day I have no idea how they came up with any kind of diagnosis, considering I had seen an actual doctor a total of two times. Additionally, this result was delivered to us, my parents and I, by the head doctor of the hospital, who I had never seen in my life, during a conclusive meeting on my last day. I was offered to stay and start behavioral therapy, but I guess it goes without saying that I politely declined that offer. Every therapist and psychiatrist I've talked to since, and trust me, there's been a few over the last seven years, have disregarded that diagnosis entirely. Some have even laughed at it. I'm currently diagnosed with bipolar disorder, depression, and a panic disorder, and my current psychiatrist has suggested I might suffer from borderline personality disorder. I guess the moral of this story is to always do research on the hospital you plan on getting yourself admitted to. I sure as shit hope I never have to see any of the guards, nurses, or doctors ever again. So, back in November 2020, I was in and out of hospital with testicular torsion eight times altogether. Because why permanently fix a medical issue when you can temporarily fix it, I guess? Thanks, NHS. And on my last time at one of the hospitals, I had called the taxi to go home, but it would take about 30 to 40 minutes to get to me because it was a Saturday in a city. Since there was going to be a bit of a wait, I decided to sit down in a bench slash garden area just in front of the hospital. It was 3 a.m., about zero degrees Celsius, and I had been awake for 36 hours at that point. My taxi was on its way, and I just sat cross-legged on the bench, headphones on, and nicotine keeping me alive. Everything was all fine until after 10 minutes, I noticed a guy very clearly walking directly towards me. He was stumbling a bit, so I just assumed he was drunk. As he got on level with me, he stopped right in front of me and said something that I didn't hear. I looked up and said, what? Sorry, I had music on. As I pulled them off, and he looked me dead in the eye and said, I could fucking batter you right now. Of everything I was expecting him to say, that wasn't on the list. So, caught off guard, I tried just disarming him with humor by saying, I don't doubt it, which did work, thank God, because he would have absolutely pummeled me into the ground. And every time I said that or something similar, he'd just say, I could batter you, I want to deck you right here right now, and I could take you in a fight, just to recall a few of them. After his anger had toned down, he sat on the bench next to me and started generally drunk rambling about his family and his friends, and very specifically, his best friend's girlfriend that he was having an affair with. Then, he pointed out my shoes, saying, those are nice, mate, can I have them? Obviously, I said no, firmly, but not aggressively, then said thanks and told him about the fact that I got them on sale. He said, can I touch them? Which was immediately a big red flag. I politely declined, and he started rubbing my shoe anyway. I was still sitting cross-legged on the bench. Then, in one swift movement, he grabbed my ankle, pulled my entire leg up to his face, and put the entire toe of my size 11 converses in his mouth. At which point, while sitting in stunned silence, I started desperately looking around, and I see the hospital police walking over. The officer asks if we were here together. He said yes. I said no. The officer then asked if he was a patient. I said yes. He said no. I told the officer I was just waiting for my taxi, and the guy rambled something I couldn't really make out to the officer, who suggested he move along. The guy stood up, gave me a handshake, and walked off into the night. The officer obviously asked if I was okay, and I told him what happened. He was just as confused as I was. After that, my taxi was due in five minutes, so I went and stood on the opposite side of the hospital where the taxi rank was. I asked some friends, who were familiar with a lot of drugs, what he could have been on, and they unanimously said meth, and the shoe thing was probably just a fetish. Random shoe biter outside hospital? Let's not meet again. This happened about seven and a half years ago, when I was 13. My grandmother was in the hospital with pneumonia. By the time my family got there, there was about 11 to 15 of us. Yeah, it's a lot, but five out of the eight children were there with their families. After a little while, they told me needed to leave so they could give her some shots. At the time, we didn't know there was a waiting room on the floor, so my uncle suggested we go down to the first floor so we could sit in the ER waiting room. We had to go down on two separate elevators, since there were so many of us. Once we got down there, we saw two nurses hiding behind a door. When we asked what's wrong, they said nothing. You can still go in there. We walked in, 
It was about 2 p.m. on a Sunday. There was no one in there, and the lights were off. Yes, in retrospect, we should have just turned around and walked back out, but like all white people in horror movies, we didn't think anything of it. We met up with the rest of the family. That's when we noticed two other guys. The first man was sitting with his hands behind his back. The second one was standing behind him, holding his wrists together. The man sitting was staring daggers right at me. After about 10 minutes of sitting and staring, a third man in a hospital security uniform came up and asked if we saw anything. Visibly confused, we said no, and they told us we needed to leave. We went back up to the fourth floor and found the waiting room. It was right next to the psych ward with a sign that said stay clear. There's a high chance of flight risks. Now, you might be thinking, what's so scary about that story? A random guy was staring at a 13-year-old girl. Well, a little while later, we found out what had happened. The man sitting with his hands restrained was a junkie looking for a quick fix. He had walked in and was told that he couldn't get any drugs without a medical reason. So, he pulled out a knife and stabbed the woman at reception in the neck. Why we were allowed in the room with this man while the hospital was supposedly in lockdown, I have no clue. I also have no clue where the police were during this whole situation. This story does have a kind of happy ending, for the woman at least. About two years ago, this incident was brought up at a family gathering. My cousin said that the woman did survive. She no longer works for the hospital and has a lot of difficulties resulting from her injury, but she was working as a secretary for a school. So, junkie who stabbed a woman and kept staring at me? Let's <laughs> not meet. I have several let's not meet stories rolling around in my head. I think today, I'm ready to tell the story of my stalker. To preface this, I know there are a lot worse stalker stories out there, and mine might be pretty mild, but it still terrified me and haunts me today nearly 10 years later. It was my first real full-time job after college. I went to school for art, but the job was basically an admin, along with a bunch of random responsibilities. At least once a week, I worked in the warehouse counting and organizing inventory. A coworker of mine started hanging around and seemed like he wanted to be friends. He was very helpful with the job. Having been there for a while and knowing the ins and outs of the company, his name was Tim. He was 46, lived in his mom's basement, had never been married. He had a cat he talked about often and claimed he used to be a hell's angel. He drove 18-wheelers and thought they were super cool. He started offering to smoke me out on lunch breaks, which I would accept because, duh. Then he started buying me lunch, stating, my friend did this for me when I was your age. I'm just paying it forward. One day you can help someone else when you have the money to spend on them. He knew all the local places to eat and would choose a place, suggesting what I should try. It was a mistake to ever accept anything from him. But I'm a foodie, and he introduced me to things like Cuban espresso and burger buffets, adding excitement to my otherwise monotonous workday. Around that time, our friend's cat had several kittens. One of them was a beautiful torty, Penny, that I knew Tim would love. So I fostered her for a bit until he decided he wanted her and he came over to pick her up. She got along with his other cat and was super sweet. He loved her and would send me pictures of her and them together all the time. We had him over, my boyfriend and I, a few times over a period of about a year. He told the same stories over and over again, but we tolerated him because we thought he was lonely. I made him a dating profile because he often spoke about how he wants to meet the one, etc., but he rejected every single woman he matched with. He would pick their appearance apart, on beautiful women who were in his age group, even some much younger. Now, when I say Tim is an unattractive man, please trust. He was gross, overweight, sweaty, had thick coarse black hair and a huge gap in his incisors that he would suck spit through after he laughed, licking his teeth. He had giant pores and moles, and he was just old. We did have many conversations, but I started to get the creepy vibes. For my birthday that year, he bought me a first edition of my favorite book, after I had told him this story about how I lost my mass-produced copy. I had exchanged favorite books with a friend, who ended up losing my favorite book. Her book was Twilight, which I hated. He also bought me a necklace that was for cancer survivors, which was very sweet, but also kinda really personal and awkward, but still seemed innocent enough. He would show up with a case of beer, knocking on the door unexpectedly. We tried to be hospitable, but it started getting annoying. However, I felt bad for him, 
and he was always so overly nice and helpful at work I felt bad turning him away. One day after we had lunch, while sitting in his truck in our work parking lot, he told me he thought I was the one. I reminded him about my boyfriend, and he said, no, he's not right for you. You're supposed to be with me. No, Tim, you know I care about you as a friend, but I'm not interested in anything with you like that. You're making me very uncomfortable. I love you. I can take care of you. Think of all I can do for you. I have this much money in savings. Please, stop. This is getting weird. I don't like you like that at all. Please, drop it. I got out of the truck and shut the door. The storm was brewing. After he confessed his love for me, I told my husband, then boyfriend, everything. He had warned me, and he reminded me how he called it. How he always knew this would happen, that Tim's creepy, that I shouldn't have accepted all the food and gifts, etc. He was totally right, and I felt sick. I started putting distance between Tim and I, while still being kind and sociable at work. I told my husband everything. Tim would call me over and over again, even though I always ignored his call. Until one night, we got sick of it, and I answered the phone and told him to stop calling me. He was crying and begging me to talk to him. My boyfriend took the phone and told him to fuck off and hung up. That's when the threats started. He would leave voicemails about how he couldn't stand to look at Penny, and about how he was going to take her in the woods and kill her, or he could just let her free. She would be eaten by wild animals since she was still so small. He said she reminded him of me, and that he hated her as much as he hated me, that he wanted to bash her brains in. I started to call into work sick. I didn't want to see him. He ignored me deliberately, which I appreciated. He wouldn't look at me, but acted normal besides his sudden coldness towards me. Seeing him was awful. I ended up getting laid off. Tim had other co-workers try to contact me on his behalf, people reaching out telling me I need to call him, that he's hurt by my sudden leaving. I would get calls from random phone numbers in my area and it would be Tim. I would hang up as soon as I heard him say hello. I changed my phone number. We moved across the country. It was maybe a year later. He somehow found my new number and called again, leaving this huge voicemail. He said he had found the one, but also he was dying. I can't remember how or why he was dying. It's all hazy now, but he needed this innovative technology or surgery that happened to be only available in my town, in my state a thousand miles away from where he lived, and we worked together a year before, and he wanted to meet up. It was all such a coincidence, and he was so excited to catch up and introduce me to his pregnant fiance. He also needed my address. At this time, I was pregnant with my first and only child. Tim said his fiance was pregnant too, that we would be parents at the same time. At that moment, I blocked every single person I had ever known from that town on Facebook. Every single person that knew Tim that he could have gotten information from, I changed my phone number again. The nightmare started of him showing up in the middle of the night, having somehow found us, of him carrying a case of beer, banging on the door, sucking spit through his teeth. I felt like he wanted to find me so he could get back at me somehow. Looking back, he was a total incel. <laughs> I don't know if any of his story was true or what his plans were. Anyways, F this dude. I'm a 911 call taker. And in my profession, I can definitely say that we hear all sorts of crazy things. And I know what you're thinking. Have you gotten that my cat is stuck in a tree call? Yes. Yes, I have. Now, I want to clarify some things before I continue. I will be changing the names of the people involved to protect their identity, the location of where the events took place, and I will not mention the agency I work for. In my agency... Being a 911 call taker and a dispatcher are two completely different positions. My job is to take the calls as they come in, jot down the necessary information, and then send it over to the police and fire dispatchers so they can send the information to the units out in the field. We work 12-hour shifts, and we get anywhere from 200 to 300 plus calls on a single shift. When I started, I was told that there are three calls you never forget. Your first call, your last call, and the call that will haunt you forever. The day started just like any other. I was working the night shift so I would be at work from 6 in the evening to 6 the following morning. I had my dinner, coffee, and Mountain Dew ready to go. I got situated at my station, logged into the system, and began to take calls. Just a regular night. 
I had a motor vehicle crash where one driver was trapped inside his vehicle. I had a domestic situation where a kid called in saying that his dad was beating up his mom. And a parking complaint. Nothing major. My buddy Frank was in the station next to me and said, Quiet night, isn't it, Kevin? I turned to him and said, There you go, Frank. Opening that big mouth of yours, you said the Q word and now the night is going to go to shit. <sighs> For those of you who don't know, the word quiet or any other synonym is frowned upon being said while on shift. He chuckled and went back to his phone. Surprisingly, the night did stay pretty quiet. Around midnight is when calls start to die down, so I went up and heated my dinner. When I came back, I saw that there was a 911 call waiting to be answered. I asked if anybody was going to take the call, but no one else had it popping up on their screen. I just brushed it off and took the call. 911, where's your emergency? I asked into the phone line. I got nothing but silence. I spoke again. 911, where is your emergency? Still silence. I took the phone number and ran it through our system to pinpoint the possible location of the call. Because the call came in as a cell phone, I located the cell phone tower it came off of and was able to find where the call was coming from after that. I managed to find that the call was coming from my neighborhood. Nothing struck me as alarming at that point because I get calls like this all the time. 911, where's your emergency? I asked a little louder. Then the phone went dead. Per our general orders, we have to call back. So that is what I did. I called back. But I was met with a voicemail saying the person could not be reached at this time. Again, I wasn't shocked. I get calls where there's an open line and nothing happens more often than not. I hung up, filed the call away. And when I clicked the button to be ready for the next call, the phone immediately rang. 911, where's your emergency? Again, silence. I looked at the number and it was the same number that had just called me. Listen, if this is a bunch of kids prank calling, know that you are dialing 911 and I will send the police out if this continues to be an issue. Do you understand? I waited for a response, but none came. Hello? Is anyone there? This is a sir. And then, a blood-curdling scream came across the line. I jumped out of my seat and my headset flew off. I quickly gathered my composure and got back on the line. Hello? Hello, are you there? I tried to get an answer, but all that was there was screaming. It sounded like a woman, and something was being torn. I could actually hear tearing in the background. It was hard to make out due to the woman screaming, but I could still hear it. Ma'am, can you hear me? Where are you at? The phone went dead again. I quickly sent a call through to the dispatchers with the information I had. Location, 46728 Benedict Lane. Incident, assault with injuries. Comments, call taker can hear a female screaming and something being torn. Cannot get any further information from the caller. Caller has hung up. Will attempt to make contact again. I sent the call to the dispatcher and immediately the call was sent out due to the severity of my comments. I called the number again but was met with the same voicemail. I tried again, two more times, but I got the same result. I updated the call saying that I couldn't make further contact. I watched on my mapping screen as the units were on the way to the house. I looked down and saw a call pending in my queue. I answered the phone, but before I could say anything I was met with the same female screaming again. I shouted to try and get her attention. Hello? Ma'am, can you hear me? Help me! Help me! Somebody help me! I heard her scream into the phone. Ma'am, I have help on the way. Tell me what's going on. He's here. He's here, he's here, he's here. Ma'am, who is there? I'm going to die. I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Ma'am, you're not going to die. I'm going to be on the phone with you until help arrives. They're almost there. I continued to try and get more information about her, but I wasn't getting anywhere. Then, in the background, I heard a male's voice. Abigail. 
Oh, Abigail, why are you hiding from me? We've played lots of games tonight, but hide and seek is not one I wanted to play. Ma'am, your name is Abigail? Yes. Okay, Abigail, listen to me. Help is almost there. Tell me, who is this man? I... I don't know. He just appeared in my house and then... Then he... She couldn't finish her sentence before she began to break down crying. The only thing that snapped her out of it was the man. In the background, I could hear a door creak followed by light footsteps and then he spoke. Abigail, if you promise to come out right now... I promise that the last game we play will be fun. It's called Tag. You remember how to play, right? Abigail didn't give a response. Abigail, I know you're in the fucking closet. You don't want to play? Fine. I'll just come in there and join you. I could hear the footsteps get louder and louder as he approached the closet door. It sounded like he was at the door when I heard through the phone... This is the police. The house is surrounded. You have lost. Come out with your hands up and we'll do this the easy way. I guess it really is time to play hide and seek. I heard him say as he ran out the room. Abigail, I'm still here. The police are downstairs. You're safe now. No, I'm not. I'll never be safe. And with that, she hung up the phone. One of the most frustrating things about being a call taker is that you never really get to find out what happens to the calls you send through. I mean, sometimes you'll be able to guess, but 99% of the time, you'll be left in the dark. What I do know about this call is that the guy was never found. The police never saw anyone come out of the house at all, and when they searched the entire residence, they didn't find anyone either. They questioned Abigail about who the man was, But all she could say was, I'm not safe. I will never be safe. No evidence of forced entry or DNA that didn't belong to Abigail was ever found. To this day, no one knows who the man was. Months passed and no further information was ever found until, finally, the case went cold. That call has haunted me since that night. Why am I telling you all about this? It's to warn you and my fellow call takers that there is a dangerous person on the loose. How do I know this? Because he called me. Earlier during my shift, I got a call, and when I answered the phone, the voice I heard on the other side sent a chill down my spine. Hello, Kevin. Are we still playing hide-and-seek? Because if we are, it's your turn to hide. I'm really at the end of my rope here. No, check that. I was at the end of my rope weeks ago. Now I'm sort of clinging to the side of the cliff by one bloody fingernail. I didn't even know that you could get banned from calling 911. 31 calls over 36 nights later, and I know the truth. They told me that unless they find an actual emergency situation, the next time they respond, they'll arrest me on the spot and haul me off to jail. And you know what? Honestly, that doesn't sound like a bad idea right now, except for the part where I'd probably lose my children. Like I said, this started 36 nights ago. My ex-husband had the kids for the weekend and I was looking forward to just relaxing by myself with some red wine and something dumb on Netflix. I was in the kitchen pouring out my wine when I looked out the window and I thought I saw something there in my yard, a person. It was dark out, so I rushed over to the light switch and flipped it up. The outside light turned on and flooded the yard. Nothing there. I shrugged it off and sat down on my couch, scrolling through my Netflix options. Then, the front door started rattling. That got my attention. After a while, the rattling stopped, but I sat there frozen for several minutes. Then the doorbell rang. The sound, like a dagger into the silence. I spilled some wine. It's probably Alan. Probably just forgot something for the kids and forgot that I changed the lock. I sighed and got up to check the door through the peephole. Somebody was there all right, but it wasn't Alan. At least, I didn't think so. 
It was a man, dressed all in black, including a black ski mask. As I was watching him, he reached down and grabbed the doorknob and started rattling the door again. That was when I made my first 911 call. I have seen that man every night since. The only reason I've made 31 911 calls instead of 36 is that for four of those nights, the cops were parked right outside of where I was staying. When I saw him, I only needed to flick the lights four times and that would signal the cops. And while I saw that man for 36 nights in a row, the cops saw him zero times. Not after I installed a camera pointing in my backyard. Not after I installed cameras all around the house. Not after I installed the cameras inside the house. They never saw him, but I did. Every night, sometimes hiding in the shadows, sometimes standing inches away from me, breathing heavily. I will tell you about one night, so you can understand how terrified I am. This was definitely the worst night in isolation, but the longer this goes on, the more every night becomes worse than the last. This was a bit over a week ago, maybe 10 days. I started off feeling some guarded relief. The cameras were all installed around the house, and the cops were parked outside. If and when this creep showed up, they'd get him. Or if not, then at least the cameras would prove that he existed, and maybe offer up some clues to his identity. I put the kids to bed and let myself have a bit of wine, to help relieve that lingering terror. By the time I was ready for bed, I felt fairly relaxed and confident that I was safe for the first time since this thing started. I was ready for a good night's sleep, and I passed out pretty much as soon as I settled into bed. Sometime in the night, I was awakened by the creak of the floorboards by the foot of my bed. For half a second, I was confused with the half-hangover haze. Then I understood. Somebody was in the room with me. I had a gun in the room, but I kept it in a lockbox at the top of my closet where the kids couldn't reach it. It was useless to me just then. How the hell did he get past the cops, I wondered, as another foot landed on the floor with a soft thud. Mommy? My heart almost exploded with relief. It was my four-year-old kid, Alex. Come on, I said, sitting up and patting the bed. On most nights, he still ended up in there with me. Mommy? There's a man in my room and he wants to see you. I bolted out of my bed. Stay here, I said, running to the closet for the gun. He's nice, said Alex. He gave us candy. Oh God, Shane is still in there. My hand gripped the gun in the box, wavering. Did I want to bring a loaded gun into a room with my six-year-old kid? I didn't know the answer, but I pulled the gun out anyway and ran down the hall after closing Alex in my room. When I got there... There was a man sitting on the bed with Shane. Shane was eating a candy bar, smiling. Mom, he said. Mr. Knight is awesome. How come you never told us about him? The man was holding a knife up behind Shane's back. I kept the gun behind my own back. What do you want? I asked. Then I heard the man speak for the first time. He kept changing his voice modulating it in an agitated way so that it was really high-pitched and then really low, now fast and smooth, now slow and stuttering. I want what any man wants, he said. I want your devotion and your gun. Hand it over or you know the boy goes night, night for a long, long time. The hand holding the gun was slick with sweat, and my stomach was in knots as my heart pounded away in primal terror. You have a gun, Mom? asked Shane. And if I do give it to you, then what? I asked the man. Then I'll leave for now. No sense causing a ruckus with those officers down there if I don't have to. He lifted the knife an inch higher. And no sense you causing a ruckus either, is there? I handed him the gun. Good call, he said. He lowered the knife, then turned to Shane. Hey, bud, Mr. Knight has to get going now. Lots of other kids to give candy to. You be a good boy and we'll meet again soon. Yeah? 
I'll be good, said Shane. The man stood up and walked to the open window. I know that I locked that. He stepped out on the garage roof as I grabbed Shane and yanked him back into my room. I flicked my lights on and off four times. By the time the cops got inside and upstairs, the man was gone. That was the last night I spent with my kids. I see them during the day, but never at night. The man does not seem interested in them, only in me. I can't, for the life of me, think of who this man might be. Somebody I know? I'll admit, I did turn my thoughts towards Alan, my ex-husband. We had had some nasty fights before and after the divorce. But would he really hold a knife above his own child's back? I didn't think so, but I tested it one night. The kids stayed with my mother, and Alan stayed with me in the kids' room. I knew it wasn't him because at 1 a.m. I woke up to the man throwing acorns at my window. He was there in the driveway, somehow always just out of the camera's view. Alan was snoring away in Shane's bed. I've racked my brain trying to think of who it could be. It just doesn't make sense. None of it does. It's just a nightmare without reason. How is he there every night and always gone without a trace by the time the cops get there? How is it possible? It doesn't matter where I am. At my house, at my mother's house, at this hotel. He always finds me. He always lets me see him. And he always disappears back into the night. Sometimes, I wonder if I really am imagining it. Shane and Alex both say they remember Mr. Knight. But maybe I put that thought in their head. That's what the cops think. That's why they've issued a written warning to me about calling 911 again. And... It's what Alan thinks. He's started to talk about taking full custody, at least until I get better. Sometimes the man leaves me notes, but they are always printed out and the cops think that I'm the one who prints them out. They even found a Word doc on my computer with one of the notes. And now, now I'm holding the latest note, which he slipped under my hotel door as I was writing this. It says, tonight's the night. I don't know what to do. If I call the cops and he's not here, I get arrested and probably lose custody of my kids. And if I don't call the cops and he is going to do something tonight, he's here. <laughs> Back in 1998, I picked up a part-time job by working for a small liquor store a few blocks away from my house. I was there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights as I went to college during the rest of the week. Apart from the regulars who would show up for their drinks, lotto tickets, and the kids on the block that would get their fill of hot Cheetos, my job there was pretty easy. And while I could spend hours writing out all the boring nights I had waiting for my clock off time, I want to focus on an event in particular that has forever left me paranoid. More so because I feel that any time I'm alone, danger is literally going to pop out of nowhere. Yes, even some 20 plus years later. So, the night in question. It's a relatively slow and rainy Saturday night, and I was sitting on my stool watching the news on my little television monitor. I was also eating some Subway that a couple of my friends had stopped by to drop me off, since they were in the area and the manager wasn't around. I was also trying to catch up on a book I needed to read for one of my classes, but I think you can already guess that was unsuccessful. Anyways. Everything is going fairly smoothly until a man in a hoodie walks into the store. I was notified of his arrival when I heard the front doorbell chime. I greeted him a friendly hello when I asked him that if there was anything he needed help with, he just needed to ask. But he ignores me and walks down one of the aisles. Hmm, he must have been having a bad night, I thought. Whatever. I returned back to my book, with the TV as background noise. And after about a minute, I noticed I hadn't seen or heard the man in the hoodie. Where could he be? I looked up, and then I saw he was now making his way back to me. No items. Hmm, so much for buying something. Just as I'm about to speak up and ask if he needed help with something, he shoves me up and pulls out a handgun. Empty the cash register and hand over whatever is in there. I froze and went into a sort of state of shock, as he once again demands I hand over the cash. It wasn't until he walks over to me on the other side of the counter that I finally snapped out of it and I began to realize the severity of the situation. 
It's now I begin putting money into a small grocery bag, hoping and praying I would be able to make it home in one piece. Give me the scratcher tickets too. All of them. Fast. I hand those over in a heartbeat, and after what seemed like an eternity, though was honestly more like 40 seconds, he runs out of the store, leaving me on the verge of tears. Sure, I'm no kid. I was 20 at the time. But having someone take out a gun on you while you're working alone is going to make you practically scream and wet your pants. My next reaction was to quickly lock the front door, and then call for the police, explaining that the shop had just been robbed. In the time it took them to get there, a customer, who was a regular, happened to show up and knocked on the door. I got so scared because I thought it was the robber coming back to finish the job, but I breathed a sigh of relief when I saw his face. When all was said and done, police did review the security footage, and about a week later, the man was caught and arrested for armed robbery. Since this incident, I have never had anything as remotely frightening as this happen to me again, and I hope it remains that way. I used to work as a waitress at a diner in Southern California that saw me earning minimum wage and life experience. It being my first job, I was 19 at the time. I quickly learned that in the world of customer service, you're going to get a lot of creepers. People who I truly believe have nothing better else to do with their lives. I mean, there's innocent conversations and genuine questions that can be seen as something normal. But then you have the oddities. The ones that leave you taking a step back. Such was a day I was working in the evening. It's about an hour before closing, and the diner is slowly reaching emptiness. There's one of the regulars having himself a steak dinner at the front bar counter, and you got a couple of truck drivers who were enjoying our all-day breakfast at one of the tables. There I was, wiping down said front counter, listening to the music playing on the intercom and talking to my regular. After about five minutes of talking, the truck drivers called me over and wanted to tell me how great of a job I was doing. I thanked them for the compliment as they hand over what's due, and I noticed there's an extra $100 bill. Asking if they needed me to break it, they said it was mine and that they wanted to thank me for such friendly service. I'll admit, I fought back tears as they tell me they had been driving for days, and this was the first time one of the waiters slash waitresses they spoke to was actually friendly to them. I guess that was one good thing my grandma always taught me. Be kind to people. Anyways, with joy filling my soul, my regular eventually leaves and we soon close the shop. It's now I make my way over to my car, only to realize I had forgotten my purse. Figures as such. Thankfully, I catch the manager just before he leaves the parking lot, and he ends up opening the diner so I can get my belongings. This is when it would begin. While walking over to my vehicle for a second time, parked completely separate from any vehicles, I noticed a figure stumbling toward me, acting very bizarre and strange. I'll admit, I did get a bit spooked, so I reached for my keys in my purse, which has a little pepper spray bottle. Do you happen to have a lighter on you, little missy? The figure, who I now determine to be a homeless man, says to me, as he begins to get closer and closer. No, I don't. Sorry. I wish I could help you out. He pauses and stands still for a few seconds, as I suddenly get the strong whiff of alcohol. On second thought, maybe you'll do. I let out a nervous chuckle, as just as suddenly as the man arrived, he quickly reveals he's armed as he takes out a knife. Now, I might be close to my vehicle, but I'm not close enough to where I believe I'd make it in one piece. What was I to do? I did start to back up, and I did end up using my pepper spray on the guy, which only caused him to grow angrier. Luckily, I was going to have a little help on my side. Hey, what are you doing? Get away from her. I looked behind me, and it's the two truck drivers from earlier who had been eating at the diner. You see, I hadn't realized it, but they had their truck parked all the way on the other side of this parking lot. I had no idea it was there since I had assumed they had already left. Needless to say, the homeless man freaks out as the truck drivers come to my aid. Meanwhile, Creeper drops the knife. When cops do eventually arrive, no less than five minutes later, they ended up handcuffing and arresting him. That's not, of course, before they assisted with washing the pepper spray out of his eyes. Served him right for pulling a knife out on me, 
I was just acting in self-defense. Now, I do believe had it not been for those kind truck drivers, my experience might have turned out a little differently. I mean, I'm sure I could have easily have outrun them, but these days, you just don't know. I've never seen those truck drivers again, but I do believe fate brought those two into my life for a reason. During 2020, I knew of many friends who were let go from their jobs due to the lockdowns, myself included. I worked at Disneyland at the Lamplight Lounge as a host, and when it was announced we were closing indefinitely, I grew sad. Sure, making money was one of the main motives of working there, but I also enjoyed being able to get out of my house and interact with people. But because the current situation had me thinking about how I would pay bills, I started job searching to no avail. One day I was working on my resume, and one of my friends had mentioned how she was making pretty decent earnings working for food delivery. How I hadn't thought about that, I had no idea. I guess I was just so into trying to get a job similar to what I used to do that I didn't think about delivering food, although when you think about it, they do share their similarities. Anyways, one thing leads to another and I started working for Grubhub. Pretty easy gig. You worked as much or as little as you wanted. So as I had nothing else to do, I was pretty much working all day every day I could. How simple. Except the order. Go to the restaurant and pick up the food and then deliver said food to the location you're given. How bad could it be, right? I mean, you're most likely asking yourself, what's so scary about being a Grubhub delivery driver? Nothing really. It's just the fact you don't know what kind of people you're going to meet at the end of your delivery, which is what makes this story that much more intriguing. Anyways, enough backstory. Let's get into the meat and potatoes. It's a Saturday night and I'm just winding down from my day of delivery. Before I decided to call it, I accepted one more order from McDonald's, which was only about 5 minutes from my current location. So once I grabbed the food, I begin a roughly 10 minute drive to the house in question. Unfortunately, the address I was delivering to was in a pretty sketchy part of LA, where the story takes place by the way. But what could be the worst that happens? It should just be a quick drop off, and I'll skedaddle out of there. I remember passing by a home that was covered in yellow police caution tape, and I even saw another home with bullet holes in the walls, which brought chills down my spine, reminding me of the true crime documentaries I binge watched. Anyways, as I pulled up into the cul-de-sac in question, I saw a group of about 10 males surrounding some low riders and listening to some music in Spanish. They were anywhere from about 20 to 30 years old, with long white t-shirts, large blue jeans, similar shaved heads, and tattoos over their arms. I also noticed they were drinking beer as there was a large cooler next to them. One thing they did do was a sort of death stare at me and my car, which honestly made me think I was about to get clapped, so to speak. Either way, I ignored them and I finally reached the house. It was pretty old. There was a flickering light on the front porch and a couple of dudes hanging out on their lawn chairs, smoking cigars and laughing. A pet bull that was behind a fence startled me as I approached the men, who tell me to leave the food on their little table. Now I'll admit, I don't like to judge people or locations, but I was really scared for some reason, and I was about to find out why my senses were running wild. Once I dropped off the food and they thanked me, I turn around and start to head to my car. But I noticed two of the men I saw when I turned into the cul-de-sac walk over in our general direction and started yelling and cursing in their drunken states. I wasn't sure if they were speaking to me until the two behind me on the front porch started yelling back and telling them to get lost. It wasn't really my problem and when I got into my car, I sighed a breath of relief. But what happens next has remained a memory even until today. Once I passed the two drunken guys, I heard a pop, which I determined to be a gunshot. The rest of the group who had been drinking quickly stopped what they were doing, and they began running in the direction I just come from. I even noticed some of them had pulled out knives and pistols. Needless to say, I can safely assume I had avoided a serious fight and crossfire, which could have seen me get hurt. Anyways, in summary, I stopped delivering food after that night, and luckily I was able to get a job working at a grocery store in the deli section. That is until just a couple of months ago. Disney called me back, and I'm once again working at the Lamplight Lounge, 
where I haven't had a single problem since. This happened a few years ago, but still freaks me out when I think about how differently it could have turned out. My hubs, baby, and I used to live in the not greatest apartment complex. There were three sections of the complex with a total of six apartments. Three on top, three on bottom, in two different buildings within each section. I lived in the upper level, middle apartment, on the second building in the second section. I got along with my neighbors fine. We actually all moved into our apartments within a few weeks of each other. To my left is a woman we will call Barb, in her fifties, and lives alone. Barb is a drinker and a big participant of any substances that make her feel good. Has a rotation of man friends that come and go. All fine by me. She gives me no issues, so I really don't give a fuck about what she does. But it needs to be mentioned for story purposes. I already mentioned that these weren't the best apartments. They were income-based, old and cheap. I'm pretty sure the walls were insulated with newspaper if they had any insulation at all. So you could hear basically everything from both surrounding apartments and a lot from the units below. Only time it really became an issue is during nap time and night time when something would either prevent my one-year-old from sleeping or wake him up. It didn't happen often. And when it did, I was able to go knock on the noise culprit's door and handle it with no issues. Since my child was still a baby and I was constantly exhausted, 90% of the time his bedtime was my bedtime. Our bedrooms were on the opposite end of the apartment, from living room, kitchen, balcony, Barb's apartment. We also slept with both a noise machine and a fan to drown out any noise disturbances during the night. This particular night, though, my husband was off work and we decided to watch a movie. There was a party going on in the first building of our section. Barb was friends with the party throwers and we could hear her in and out of her apartment door several times as well as all the party people who were outside smoking. At some point during the movie, I fell asleep using my husband's lap as a pillow. Around 2 a.m., loud laughing from Bard's apartment wakes me up. I get up to pee and brush my teeth before coming back to kiss my husband goodnight and get in bed. Do my business and making my way back up the hall to the living room from bathroom to tell my husband goodnight. I hear knocking on Barb's door, followed with what sounds like her door exploding off its hinges and flying into the wall that separates her apartment and ours. My husband and I both say what the fuck at the same time and kind of just freeze. We hear Barb and a man talking and it sounded like normal talking. They weren't yelling or anything, so we chalk it up to Barb and her guest having a little too much fun at the party and shrug it off. I get in bed and quickly fall back asleep. No more than 10 minutes after getting into bed, I wake up to what sounds like heavy furniture being body slammed coming from Barb's apartment, irked as fuck from the second slumber disturbance, and knowing this is going to wake my kid up, I make my way to the living room, planning to put my slippers on and knock on Barb's door, and kindly ask her to shut the fuck up. I first walk out onto my balcony to smoke a cigarette, while hoping she realizes how loud whatever the fuck she's got going on is, and fix it without being asked. The body slamming furniture only gets even louder while on the balcony. So I assume they've worked their way through her apartment and are now body slamming her bedroom furniture now. Even more irritated now, I decide Barb's too blitz to realize how loud she's being and I'm going to have to remind her that none of us are deaf in my apartment. So she was going to have to move her furniture fight somewhere else or reschedule for normal furniture fighting hours which are obviously during the day. I stand up and take a few steps towards Barb's bedroom window, where our small bucket for cigarette butts sits on the ledge of my balcony. Her bedroom window and the closest edge of my balcony to her window are only inches apart. She could easily crawl out of her window and onto my balcony, and vice versa. And that's when I hear it. Muffled screams like someone is holding a hand over a mouth, and a man's voice say in a very low voice, If you don't shut the fuck up, I'm going to kill you, you fuckers. So you're going to fuck me and like it. Oh, fuck is my first thought. I fly inside the sliding door from my balcony and grab my phone to call 911 while telling my husband Barb is in trouble. He goes out and bangs on her door. Nobody comes, and it's locked because he tried the door handle after not being answered. I'm standing between the living room and kitchen, 
on the phone with 911. And husband walks outside and leans over to see if he can see anything through Barb's windows. The blinds are closed, but a couple of blind slats are broken, leaving a small crack big enough for my husband to see someone lying on the floor halfway in her bedroom and halfway into her bathroom, and another person standing over them. He tells me, and I relay it to the 911 operator, while also adding, if the police aren't here soon, we're going to bust the door down ourselves. She calmly asked me not to do anything like that, to stay on the line, and that the police were en route and would arrive soon. About two minutes later, we hear several pairs of boots coming up the apartment stairs to get to the second level of our apartment, and then loud pounding, knocking with, Police department, open up! I crack my front door to peek out and tell them we can still see two people in the back bedroom of Barb's apartment. There are four uniformed police officers with their guns drawn, and the one standing in my front door tells me to go back inside and lock the door. Yes, sir. I go back inside and straight right inside my balcony door to watch for anything, like Barb trying to escape the man or the man trying to escape the cops. Here, another round of police pounding at Barb's door going unanswered, and then the sound of the door being kicked in. Fire and rescues have shown up by this point, and the whole complex is lit up with lights coming from emergency vehicles. We hear a small scuffle, and then the screen door of her apartment creaks open. I look out of the peephole and see a man in handcuffs being led down the stairs and then EMT coming up the stairs with a stretcher. A few minutes later, we hear the screen door creak open again and I see EMT carrying a stretcher with someone in it and open my door. Barb is unconscious and in bad shape. Her face and head are bloody and swelling and exposed skin of her arms are already bruising. As I'm staring at her in the stretcher, going down the stairs in disbelief. The same police officer that told me to get back inside and lock my door walks out of Barb's apartment and asks if he can speak to my husband and me. I say yes and invite him inside, where he thanks us for calling 911 and tells us he has little doubt that we saved Barb's life, asks us what we heard and I reiterate the whole story from beginning to end as he takes notes. He thanks us again and leaves. Barb calls me about a week later from the hospital to thank me. I ask her how she is and she tells me that she has a fractured skull and, and bleeding on her brain, broken cheekbone and jaw, broken ribs and lots of bruising all over her body, but feels lucky to be alive and thanks me again. She also tells me the man is someone she has known for several years, that he had showed up at the party right before she went home to her own apartment and was mad she didn't want to sleep with him and even madder that she had been super flirty with the POC at the party. Several months later. The ADA prosecuting the man calls me and asks me to tell her everything from that night. So I tell her, from start to finish too. She asks me if I would be willing to testify in court and I tell her whatever she needs to lock that animal up. A couple of weeks after that, I come home and have a summons on my door to be a witness in the case. But the court date listed is already passed. I call the ADA back and explain both worried about how me not testifying hurt the case and putting him away and also if I had a warrant out for my arrest for not showing. She tells me that the date was wrong, but that I'm also not needed. Catch up with Barb a few weeks after that, and she tells me that my recorded call to 911 was used during court and that the guy got 15 years in prison. I used to live in a trailer park for my sophomore year in college. It was a really nice city, super liberal and hippy-dippy. My two roommates were off in class, but I took the day off as our dishwasher took a crap and I had to wait for the repairman to show up. It was one of those ridiculous, anytime between 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. things. I did not want to wait a day longer as my roommates sucked at hand washing dishes, and I would have to wash them all again as I cooked most of my meals at home and we had a limited kitchen set. Anyways, I sleep in until about 10.45 a.m. and my alarm goes off. I probably dicked around for a few minutes, then got in the shower, not expecting the repairman to be around till afternoon. I was butt naked and a head full of shampoo when I heard someone knock at the door. I started washing as quick as I can when I hear the more aggressive knocking. Dude is waiting like five seconds between each volley of knocks, thinking he must have been knocking for a while and I didn't hear him in the shower. I was feeling bad for making him wait. As I am drying off and quickly putting on some clothes, I hear a very loud boom 
come from the door. I kind of second-guessed myself and thought, did I really just hear that? I stopped for a second. Then I heard another loud boom, and I definitely could make out the noise of my door being forced in and opening. I thought about going to my room to retrieve any one of my three guns. Then I realized they were still all in their cases after my last range day with the locks on them. I was almost smiling at the irony of my preparations for this scenario, and I got caught lacking the one day it all mattered, naked and afraid. I heard someone call out hello, and I decided to go meet my maker in a t-shirt and a towel wrapped around my ding-dong. I figured if there was a fight coming, maybe they would second-guess getting my half-washed nuts rubbed all over them. I walked down the hallway and leaned out in the kitchen, which has a vision of the front door. My door had been smashed in all right, and the wood frame was shredded. I caught the gaze of a scrawny man, about my size, five foot ten, holding a sledgehammer, standing just beside my ruined door. He honestly looked just as surprised as me, and he says, I am so sorry, I did not think anyone was home, and fucking bolts away. I am like as confused as can be, just looking at my smashed door half naked like an idiot. I finally throw on some pants and go outside to investigate, but it was far too late to catch the culprit. My door had two huge dents in it, but it held up. Just the frame had been beaten in and left two gashes going in. One where my doorknob was and the other where my deadbolt was. I had a suspicion that it was not a burglar, so I called my dad and asked him if the repairman he sent had just come by and explained what just happened as best I could. He said he would call me back. I get a ring from him a few minutes later while I'm seeing if I can salvage the door and he sounds livid. The contractor they sent was mistakenly told the job was for an asbestos test. Typically what has to be done before a trailer is taken to the dump. The guy must have assumed the home was vacant and let himself in after a courtesy knock and got scared when I was home and ran away. The part that made my dad angry was that they tried to say we had to pay for the damages for some smooth brain reasoning the greaseball manager came up with and ended up with a see you in court from my dad. He told me to photograph anything we could use as evidence and he would drive over to help me fix my door as he was only about an hour's drive. Making a very long and boring story short after that, it all ended up with a contracting company deciding to just cough up $200 instead of going to court and the cherry on top was they sent the man that beat my door in back to give me the most awkward and rehearsed apology. I was reminded of this story as I drove past their office today and saw their doors were shuttered and everything was gone. Hopefully out of business and no longer sledging doors in for surprise asbestos tests. I want to preface this story by stating that I've had my fair share of encounters with creepy men. This situation however, scared the life out of me. It's the first time I genuinely felt like my life was in danger. My husband and I had to drive 17 hours last week to North Carolina for a wedding. It was an exhausting week, and we basically spent the entire time rushing from one family gathering to another. We were staying in a motel for the time we were there. We had already been at this motel for a few days by the time the day of the actual wedding rolled around. The day of the wedding was hectic. We were rushing around trying to get ready to leave for the venue. My husband got ready before me so he could do some last minute things before we had to leave. That left me alone in our motel room to get ready before he returned. It was brutally hot outside and I decided to do my hair makeup in just my underwear so I wouldn't be sweating in my nice dress the whole time. The way this motel was laid out, the sink slash mirror were in the general open area of the room, with the toilet and shower in another room. So anyone walking by our room window could see me standing at the mirror. However, I did have the curtains closed, but these curtains were a little bit sheer, so you could technically see the shadow of someone walking by on the outside, or could maybe see the silhouette of me inside the room. I was curling my hair in the mirror when I noticed the silhouette of a man walking by my room window. As he's passing my window, I see him stop and start trying to look into my window. At first, I thought it was my husband trying to see if I was ready, so I paid no mind to it. 
but the longer the guy stood there, bobbing his head around, trying to get a better look through the curtains, I began to realize it was not my husband. Because obviously, why wouldn't he just come in? Now I'm starting to get a little freaked out. Before I could do anything though, I watch as this guy starts to go for my room door. My utter shock and horror came when he actually was able to open the door and walked inside. Before my husband left, he forgot to pull the door shut all the way till it clicked into its lock. He was very upset at himself when I told him this later. So now, I am face to face with this man, and I'm in my underwear no less, who's at least six foot tall and standing in my room. I thought to myself, this is it, he's going to attack you. That's a very scary realization to have. I also thought to myself, you're going to have to burn his eye sockets out with this curling iron if you want to survive. For a few seconds, probably only a second or two, but it felt a lot longer. He just stood there, staring at me like I was a piece of meat and he was starving, ready to pounce on me like prey. He then began to smile the most <laughs> evil looking, toothy <laughs> grin I've ever seen and started mumbling something under his breath. I couldn't make out what he was saying completely, but I did make out the words, pretty lady and come here. I don't know if it was the fight or flight response, but I suddenly got pissed and I charged towards him, ready to strike him with my hot curling iron. I screamed as loud as I could, get the fuck out of here. It must have startled him because he jumped back out onto the balcony of the motel. I saw this as my chance and I ran for the door. I luckily was able to get to the door and slam it shut right before he was about to make his second attempt at entering inside. I immediately collapsed on the floor sobbing. I literally was too scared to move from that spot until my husband came back about 15 minutes later. I told him the whole thing and he was freaked out. He initially wanted to find the guy so he could beat the shit out of him, but I refused to let him leave my side. He must have apologized 1000 times during the rest of our trip for not making sure that the door was locked before leaving. But I told him that the day and that whole trip really was so rushed, I could see how it happened. We went to the motel management and told them the whole story. The police were obviously called and I gave them a description of the guy so they could see if it was someone who was staying in the motel. After going around to the few motel occupants, they said no one matched his description and concluded he wasn't staying there. Obviously, we were late to the wedding that day and the whole experience just ruined what should have been a happy time. We planned on staying another day before our long drive home, but we both just wanted out of there as soon as possible. We skipped most of the reception, went back to the motel, packed up and left. I'm usually always so vigilant with locking my doors, especially when I'm home alone. Just goes to show you, all it takes is that one time you forget to check your locks and that certain unwanted guest is inviting themselves in. I live in a small, small town. You blink and you miss it. The best we can boast about is a single stop sign and a gas station, which we only have because of the nearby highway. Any actual semblance of a town is 25 minutes away. So, when things get scary out here, it's amplified. The occasional homeless person is no big deal. They're often drifting through. Drug addicts run rampant and will steal everything they can from your house, but it's the normal out here. However, what happened a few years ago certainly wasn't normal. Originally, I was dead asleep in my bed. I only woke up because it was burning hot in my room, but it was summertime and not much I could do. I just remember tossing and turning until I got a creepy feeling that fell into the pit of my stomach. I glanced over to the bathroom door that was open with the light on. Everything was normal. I left the light on so I wouldn't trip and die if I had to pee in the middle of the night. Next, I glanced at the window directly across from my bed. I had no curtains but I did have a shitty set of blinds. Part of the blinds are broken from wear and tear and the crappy AC output beneath it would make them move back and forth so you'd get a glimpse outside every so often. The yard light was still going, but what made me stop 
was the outline at my window. The figure of someone was directly at my window, almost like it was waiting for the blinds to move to watch me. I didn't have an imagination as a child, that had been trained out of me, but the sight was enough to pour every horror film into my head at that moment. I squeezed my eyes shut and pulled my blankets over my head and slept in a cloth oven that night. By morning time, the figure was gone. I remember running to my mum's room on the verge of tears in the morning, telling her what happened. She laughed at me like I was an idiot and told me it was probably just a stray cat that had climbed up there for one odd reason or another. I almost believed her since my window was pretty high off the ground, but something didn't sit right. Later that day, when we were doing yard work, I glanced over at my window and saw one of our metal patio chairs had been pushed up to it. I pointed it out to my mum, who proceeded to chew me out. That's how the cat probably got up there, moron. Stop leaving furniture everywhere. But I hadn't moved it. It was heavy enough that I struggled with it. So, we moved it back and so began a pattern. At night, I'd see the figure, complain to my mum and we'd find a chair moved back every single morning. This went on for a few weeks. My mother stopped caring about my concerns until, one morning, we saw where the outside screen of my window had been sliced open. I still remember her shaking her head and complaining about those damn stray cats that we had still yet to see. I could tell she was unnerved by that development. I couldn't handle it anymore and I opted to sleep in our living room that night. The only problem was our kitchen and living room connected, which meant there were always several windows. The first night of my move went well, despite my back hurting from the couch. I avoided my room like the plague. It wasn't until about four days later we ran into an issue. I woke up and glanced at the clock above the fireplace. It read a little past 3am. I couldn't realise why I'd woken up until it happened again. There was a beam of light shining in from the kitchen window, almost like someone was shining a flashlight in. I saw it trace along the walls and land on the love seat across from the couch I was on. I was mortified. When I told my mum, she continued to laugh at me. I gave in and decided I would sleep in my dad's room even though it had a gigantic window. He slept in the recliner with a huge TV, so I felt more safe having someone around. The yard light was directly outside the window, anyways. It seemed foolproof. That was until I woke up out of habitual fear and watched through the window across from the bed. Everything seemed normal as time drug on, and I felt like a moron. Maybe my mum was right. That was until I saw a lone figure come out of the woods by the backyard shed, walk directly under the light and head to the patio furniture like he'd been here plenty of times before. I still remember the large build the man had and the confidence like he was the one who lived here and wasn't creeping around my yard in the dead of the night. I just remember listening to the TV until I fell asleep again, hoping to get another glimpse. My dad would have been pissed if I'd woken him up. He was grumpy on a good day. And terrifying on a bad day. I didn't feel like risking it unless I had solid proof because I was scared. The next morning, my mum chewed me out again for the patio furniture, which was routine almost a month later. But this time, something new happened. She demanded I stop playing in the toolboxes of the garage. A bunch of tools had been taken out and left on our doorstep. Screwdrivers, a large hammer, flashlights, etc. It wasn't me. I begged with my mum and pleaded with her. Just stay up with me one night. We couldn't close our garage because it was an open carport and I wasn't going to get my arse beaten for touching tools because of someone else. It was driving me mad. Finally, she agreed. That night, we would stay awake in the living room. I finally fell asleep before my mum did, but I remember her waking me up in a panic. She pointed to the window that overlooked into our garage. We could see the top of someone's head as they walked back and forth. There was a sound of someone placing metal tools down on the brick steps as if they were trying to be quiet. 
but couldn't fully muffle it. She whispered for me to go wake my dad. My dad was angry, having been woken up in the middle of the night by his frantic daughter. He grabbed his pistol and headed out from the back door towards the front of the house, where the garage was located. We heard my dad screaming and someone dropping tools, then the shot of a gun twice. The frantic footsteps pounding out of the garage felt like they were coming from my chest. My mum peeked out the window, then opened the door and my dad stumbled in. He had missed both shots because of his unstable aim, but told us that there was a man crouching at our front door, looking at our door handle. None of us slept that night. And in the morning, the law from the closest town arrived. They didn't do much besides ask if anything had been stolen for a description of the man and then told us to install cameras. That was it. They said the guy was probably just looking for something else to steal for quick money. If that had been the case, why hadn't he stolen the tools, the generator, the welder or broken into any of the vehicles just sitting in the garage? We finally set up hunting trail cameras around the house, but nothing has happened since. Coming home from college for holidays, I still have nightmares about the incident years later when I sleep in my own bed. I don't know what he was looking for or why he did the things he did. Whatever the case may be, man at the window, let's not meet. This happened years ago but still affects me to this day. The summer after I graduated high school, I was still living at home. I was up late once night and was packing for a camping trip with my friends. It was unbelievably hot and had the window open as I sat and folded clothes. It was around two in the morning and the next thing I knew there was a hand coming through the gap in the screen of my window. I screamed and the hand flew back out. I was stunned but there was a part of me that wondered if it was my younger brother pranking me. I got up and looked out the window and just saw the figure of a man staring back at me. I ran into my brother's room and he was there playing video games. We called the police who came and searched the area. They found nothing, warned me and my parents to lock the windows and doors and left. We were all still shaken up and my mum had a feeling that he would come back. It turns out her mother's intuition was right. She went outside and waited on our back porch. After 20 minutes or so, she saw a man dressed in black slink into our backyard along the tree line. There wasn't a fence on that side, unfortunately. He hid behind a tree for a few seconds and ran to another tree and hid there, slowly working his way towards my window. My mother yelled something to him and he took off running. The police came back out and again found no trace of him. I never opened that window again, not even the curtains. My parents installed some motion detecting lights and that seemed to be the end of that. About six months later, my friend and I got an apartment downtown together. We were really excited as this was our first place on our own. The apartment wasn't exactly the best quality but it was so fun to be living in the city. The downside was that it was street parking only. After a few weeks, my car was broken into. Nothing was taken but a single rose sat on the passenger's seat. It was creepy, but I vowed to be vigilant and safe. I always tried to park close to the entrance, near the lights, but often it was difficult to get to those spots and I would often have to park further away on darker streets. Things quickly began escalating at this point. My car was broken into at least once a week. Most of the time, a flower was left, which I always threw on the ground, but once a pair of men's underwear was left, and even more creepily, once a bag of Tootsie Rolls, as they were my favourite candy. This made me wonder if the person knew me personally, and I started to become suspicious of everyone. There was a laundry in the basement of the apartment, and one day I went down to get a load that finished drying. As I started to fold, I realised all of my undergarments, bras and panties, were gone. Another week, I had a male friend over from school and his tires got slashed during the visit. By the time the first letter arrived, I had already started making plans to move elsewhere. The letter described a love for me that had been going on for years. 
he noted things that proved he had been watching me closely. I was able to arrange for another friend to take over my lease, and I moved in with another friend on the other side of the city. It was a secured building and had an underground parking garage that was only accessible to tenants. I felt much more secure, and the extra money spent was well worth the peace of mind. Things were quiet for a few months, and then my roommate got a boyfriend. Most of us were wary of Ashley's new boyfriend from the beginning. For one, they met on MySpace after he reached out to her. Another reason was that new boyfriend, Matt, was extremely good looking, and while Ashley was a wonderful person, she just wasn't the type you would typically expect someone like him to date. Ashley was thrilled. She had never had a boyfriend and really felt like he was her Prince Charming. I thought he was weird and creepy from the beginning. Matt was on the quiet side and always seemed to be sporting an uncomfortable, leering smile. It was difficult to carry on any sort of a conversation with him because he would always make it weird with some random facts that were completely unrelated to what we were talking about. I had deleted my MySpace when the initial stalking began, but I created a dummy account to learn more about Matt. It didn't look like he really knew any of his friends in real life. There were only pictures of himself, and the rest of the information was vague. My friends and I gently tried to discourage her from seeing Matt. He technically hadn't done anything wrong, but he was just so… strange. She would immediately get defensive and would shut the conversation down. Matt started to spend more time at the apartment, and I found myself finding any excuse I could to avoid coming home. One day, I came home from work and found Matt on my couch, alone, drinking a beer. Ashley had been called into work, and she told him he could just hang out. I was furious because I didn't want to spend any time with him, so I grabbed a beer and a snack and headed off to my room and shut the door. About 30 minutes or so, he knocked on my door and suggested we watch some TV and get to know each other better because we both loved Ashley. I didn't want to, but decided that maybe I needed to give it a try. He put on a movie and I tried to just focus on the movie because I didn't want to talk. At one point, I glanced over to Matt and he was staring at me with a smile on his face. I snapped a what at him and he just continued smiling and said, I just can't believe it. Believe what? I asked. He said nothing and went back to watching the movie, still smiling. I had no idea what he was talking about, but the interaction had every hair standing up on my body. I excused myself and locked the door to my room. Another month or so went on and I had managed to avoid being home for much anything beyond sleep and showering. Matt practically lived there and had even brought a bunch of his things into Ashley's room. I really didn't want to move again but was beginning to look for other options. On their sixth month anniversary, I saw a huge bouquet of flowers on the table and an already opened card propped up next to it. I rolled my eyes and was about to leave when I decided to see what the weirdo wrote to her. When I opened the card, my heart started beating through my chest. Without even reading the words he wrote, I was shaking. The handwriting was exactly the same as the one my stalker had sent. I had kept them as evidence and dug them out of my desk for comparison. The handwriting was unique and identical. Matt was the stalker. I called the police first. As they were on the way, I called Ashley and asked her to come over. She was at work, but said she would be there when she could. I was terrified to tell her because I knew she would be shattered. The police took a statement from me and actually went to Ashley's work to get more information from her, and they ended up breaking the news. Apparently, Ashley called Matt and left a furious message even though the cops told her not to say anything, and he completely disappeared after that. There was no Matt or anyone matching his resemblance at the place he said he worked. Ashley had never been to his apartment because he said had been staying with friends while trying to save money for a trip to Europe. His family lived out of state, and she had never met a friend of his because he said they had a falling out because he was choosing to spend so much time with Ashley. 
It was all lies, and in the end, she was dating a stranger. We don't even know if Matt was his real name. The cherry on the top of this whole thing was when we went through Matt's things. He had left everything when we disappeared, and Ashley and I decided to go through everything. There was a duffel bag that was full of gym clothes, but in one of the compartments, there were about 10 pictures of me. All were taken from far away, with the exception of one of me sleeping. The sheets were current, so I know it had to have been at the current apartment before I started locking my bedroom door. A few pictures dated back to before the incident at my parents' house, which made us think that was him as well. Two pairs of my missing underwear were there, and I shudder to think of what he did with the rest. A Starbucks lid with my red lipstick marks, a necklace I hadn't even noticed missing, a few other random sick souvenirs. The police never tracked him down. I decided to accept an opportunity overseas that I had been considering and got the hell out of there. Unfortunately, Ashley and I quickly drifted apart. She had a really hard time accepting that her first love was a complete psycho. I think I had some underlying anger, maybe misplaced, for believing all of his lies and letting him into our lives. I don't know what his endgame was. Would he have tried to hurt me? Or was he simply content with being in my world? I'll never know. Being stalked changes you. Even when I lived across the world, I looked over my shoulder everywhere I went. I still have no social media accounts attached to my real name. I'm married with children and know that he moved on to torment some other poor woman. But every time I visit my hometown, I'm tense and keep a low profile. Part of me will always worry that Matt will resurface again.